So welcome. A Slack client in Rust. And uh, the talk is coined client in general, but specifically in Rust. So I'm Matthias. Uh, I work at Trivago uh, in Dusseldorf. I'm interested in Rust, just like you. Um, this is and uh, usually I talk more about my failures than about my success because uh, let's be honest. I mean, it's a simple thing, and uh, let's not make a big uh, deal out of it. But still, I think it's interesting to to look at the project itself and uh, uh, also about the. Uh, Motivation. So maybe you've heard about Trivago before, but uh, the idea is that this per month, and they generate around about three billion requests, and uh, that's a lot of data, and that's a lot of services, and uh, you you kind of want to manage all those services automatically. And on the other side, all of those uh, 1,200 employees, and the number is just growing and growing. Um, we, we currently have 30 to 50 people per week. Uh, all of them are using Slack. So you might say, hmm, on the one side, we have uh, all of those services. And on the other side, we have the Slack communication as some kind of global channel where everybody is talking to everybody. And uh, what else to do? Then writing bots uh, for chat ops. Um, maybe you want to tell uh, this client to deploy something or to give you some metrics or some monitoring or uh, to, to even having a personal agent where you say, okay, I don't want to be interrupted at that time. Please handle all the messages and do some natural language processing on that and find out if the message is really interesting and only then send it to me directly, otherwise handle it yourself, for example. So that would be kind of cool. Of course, collecting metrics, uh, for example, how many messages do we do per day? That would be interesting. How many users are there logged in at Carnival? Stuff like that. Uh, also clone alien dinosaurs and have fun. The basic motivation is always to have fun. So before we start, let's look at Slack itself. What is it and uh, why is it so important for us? Here's uh, some graph about the daily active users. And this was from 2014. And you can see that the number is just increasing. Uh, in 2014, they had uh, 15,000 users at the end. And now at the end of 2015, it went up to 500,000. Here you can still see a little dip when the holiday animation for 2016. So in 2016, uh, no, actually it was 2015, it went up to 2 million. for the next year and also I failed so the only thing I got was this so now we are at 4 million users and that's really really a high number and uh, if you say hmm also other services have this growth uh, I don't think so because this chart shows you the number of years it took a big company to go to a 1 billion valuation and uh, only took 1.25 years to go to an evaluation of uh, 1.2 uh, of over 1 billion. So, for example, you have some others on the list, Pon, which was the biggest growing company at the beginning. Then you have Pinterest, Tinder, Uber. Uber took three years to get there. Um, Trivago is also a unicorn, so currently evaluated at 4 billion, but Slack is super close. They have around about 3.8 billion now as a valuation. 
Um, so for me, it was obvious that we need something like this. Uh, I think that we don't want to switch the chat system uh, in the next couple months or years, so why not invest in that? So the idea was to create a Slack bot. But to create a Slack bot, you need a Slack client. There's no way around it. So you could have any language, but of course, uh, since I'm kind of interested in Rust, why not write one in Rust? Um, there was one in Rust. And I didn't like it. So here's an example of how to call the old Slack client. You might say, it's not that. Whatever it is, um, actually it's kind of stringy typed. Uh, you have a client that you hand into a method as a borrow. Then you have uh, some kind of test token, which is just a, a string. And uh, then you pro provide the data, the actual parameters for your method. And this is the rest of the stuff. But if you look at it, you need to pass, every time you do a request, you need to pass those two things, which always stay the same. And on the other side, you have all of those nuns here. Um, why? I mean, they are not semantic. They don't express any value. You need to remember which ones are where. Uh, you, if you mix them up, then you have a compile error or so. That's kind of frustrating for the user. And when I looked at that first, I was kind of confused. So I thought, what could be improved here? So first of all, there was no documentation. Uh, if you wanted to know how it really worked, basically you needed to look into the source code. It was not idiomatic. So it did not feel rustic or ergonomic or in any way uh, what you might expect from a good client library. There were no tests. So one thing that I like is uh, coming from a Python background uh, were the libraries in Python. So for example, I'm a big fan of the requests library. I think it's a very idiomatic Python library. So I wanted to make it as idiomatic as possible uh, and really focus on the strength of Rust. So my idea was simple. What if I create a Slack client in the beginning? So before we talk about how I did it, you need to talk about the most obvious thing in every talk, the goals. I don't know if you can read this, but uh, what it says is great ergonomics. It should be easy to use. It should feel like a real Rust client, not something that you uh, wrote for, for another language and ported. it. Um, it should be idiomatic. It should be fully documented and tested. It should have solid error handling, not throw some generic error. It should convert from JSON to some semantic types, so real Rust types, not some thingy JSON type thing that you need to And it should implement the full Slack API, so all the methods. Uh, all of those goals to bring me to the topics of this talk. I will keep it short. I could talk about all of those points and uh, 100 more for hours, but I don't want to. So I will just stick to those five things that I want to talk about. The first thing is I want to tell you a little bit about the builder pattern, what it is, and why it's kind of cool in this case. Then I want to tell you a little bit about testing. I will use a library called uh, Yup Hypermark for that. Then uh, error handling with types with 30 and uh, implementing the full Slack API with a JSON schema. So coming to the first point would be the builder pattern. So you have two libraries. One is do it yourself which is not really a library. You need to really do it yourself. And the other one is derived builder, uh, which is uh, written by people in this room. Uh, can somebody bring in? Well, actually, uh, meet up in, in 
did it because you erased uh, yeah, the, the Yeah, that, that was the initial uh, ignition was that I had this problem. Funnily, I still have this problem. Because um, there's this issue open, and uh, it can only be solved with uh, macros 2.0, as far as I understood. Uh, this is also very, very fresh. Uh, basically, what it means is, you have some internal, uh, you have some internal data, some internal struct in Rust, and uh, you want to handle it with some wrapper struct. And uh, ex exactly this situation I have in my client because um, I have some kind of builder pattern with a lot of options for the parameters, and on the other side I have a client, and. Uh, this client needs to take the arguments from uh, the user and uh, write a builder for the internal struct. So I don't know if we find a solution for that. I hope so. In the meantime, you can write it yourself. So it's not that hard, but it's a, it's a lot of writing uh, and a lot of busy work. But you can do it. Now here comes a horrible slide with horrible formatting and uh, everybody's looking at the slides now, like <laughs> everybody wants to see this, but you can probably not read it and it's fine. Uh, it's just about the, the, the high level overview. Basically what you need to do is you have a struct with some options um, and for example that would be one select method here. And it has a couple parameters, like channel, latest, oldest, and so on. And uh, then you have um, this in some kind of struct. And the optional parameters are, they are specified with an option. So you don't need to set them. They are, as I said, optional. And then you have some kind of f new function to create one uh, with the default values. So uh, the default for option uh, would be none. There, there is no uh, parameter set. And then once you have all of this built, uh, then you can do something fancy with it. Uh, here you have the, the builder, and the builder just generates uh, an object of the type that you have defined for your parameters. So this builder will generate an object of uh, a client and the history options that we saw before. So that is really cool, because then you have some very idiomatic way of writing your code. You will see later how that looks like. But if you write something like this, it's very tricky to handle all the error situations. So the next thing I want to talk about is error handling. It's, it's kind of it's kinda tricky. In the beginning, when you read about error handling, you might read it from the book, and uh, it's a long chapter, and I don't think that, would, that I can reproduce everything that's on there. But the idea is that you, for example, implement some error type, and uh, you can have a, a description for your error, and you can have, uh, what was the other thing? A description, and uh, a longer description, I don't know. But uh, for every error that you <laughs> um, define yourself, you can implement this trade. And then it gives you a lot of semantics to, to convert between your own error and other errors from other people. And it's a long uh, list of things that you can do here. And basically, if you write everything out, then you see something like this on the left. And on the right, there's a library for this. But first, let's go to the left. Uh, there's, you cannot read it, but it's very, very longish. That's what you should get from this. And uh, you, you need to implement uh, all of those traits and all of those implementations for your own error types to make them standard compatible. So on the right side, there's exactly the same. And it's a bit more readable. And uh, I will increase it a little bit, the size. So this is all you need to write if you have error handling for your client. Let's say you write a Slack client, uh, that would be one start, one way to think about it. Um, you have own errors, which are in those error curly braces, and then you have foreign links, which are usually uh, language-specific errors that were defined in the standard library. 
and you can convert between those two. And the nice thing is that this will happen automatically. You don't need to care about this anymore. Error handling becomes second nature. Once you have this set up, uh, all of the other stuff will be generated for you. So I can highly recommend uh, error chain or quick error, which is an alternative. But I kind of like error chain a bit more because it's a bit more flexible because the wording error chain indicates that you can chain errors. And what you can do is, for example, you want to open a file and it cannot be opened, then there would be an IO error, for example, and causing an own error of your own type. So basically there would be two errors. And with error chain you can chain those two together. And uh, the user will see, okay, an IO error happened and because of this, an own type error happened. For example, a Slack client I.O. error handle, uh, happened. And you can chain all of that. Uh, there's a lot of libraries that use error chain and whenever somebody is using error chain you get all of this for free. Uh, you just need to specify that you want to handle those errors and the conversion happens automatically. So, uh, as an example, uh, no real specifics, but at the top was what I had before. So maybe you have an, uh, um, an error in the conversion from some JSON to some internal type. And uh, the error will be handled with this map, uh, map error. But the problem is uh, you lose error information because error JSON says nothing about what really happened. Uh, and as a user, that's kind of a very bad experience. And uh, contrary to that, you see below what happens with error chain, you can simply say, okay, this error can happen, and if it happens, then chain it with my own type, saying unable to convert response body to a Slack type. That's much more idiomatic for a user. He knows, ah, okay, something happened during the conversion, and he gets the internal standard library error. Uh, another example, a bit more involved. First thing you see on the top right, you don't need to spy, uh, specify result response error, you only need to specify result response because the error type will always be your own error and this is already defined by error chain. So you don't even need to think about how to define it. And your code gets a lot more easy to read because you, you cannot mix it up, you always have a result of something. Uh, and then the old one was kind of strange with all this matching and so on, that was the best I could do. Uh, actually, uh, I got a lot of help to, to get this running from Colin. But uh, after that, um, with error chain, what you can do is you can again chain your error. Uh, what you could also do is you could simply add a question mark behind uh, read to string here. Uh, on the first plus line, you can say read to string something body and question mark. That would be the caret, and uh, it would. Um, it would, um, yeah, it would send the error to the caller, which is very, very helpful. And that all happens automatically for you. So, uh, nice improvement. Uh, throughout my library, all of that was uh, a big reduction in code, in duplicate code. Now, the tricky part is, you have those error types defined, you have your interface defined, and now you want to know if it really works. So what you could do is, every time you go to, uh, you go to the Slack API, you run your requests, you do real I.O., real network traffic, but the problem is that it's slow and it's error prone, because what happens if the Slack server is down or your connection is flaky, you get uh, flaky tests. So I was looking for a solution for that. And I wrote it in specifically in very, very small letters here so that you cannot read it. But it says yup hyper mock. And uh, that's a way to mock the HTTP client uh, from the real test. For example, uh, uh, in the top, you can define that every request to HTTPS slack.com will go to the fixtures um, that you defined, and this fixture is simply an HTTP response that is coming from the real Slack documentation. And then you can use this fixture in your test uh, without specifying anything. You just say client, 
and then you give it a connector, a width connector, and you, you see that the Slack request from above is passed into the client. And this is a way to mock away any network traffic and so on. So you always get a reproducible result. And the result of this client request looks, uh, looks like this below. So it's a real semantic ROS type. Um, it's a vector of messages which has real fields that you can match on. Uh, it feels very rustic. Um, and this is also how you use the client. So you create a client, uh, usually without a connector, and then you run some method like im underscore history, which is a Slack method, and uh, with some parameters, and you, you write send, and you get the response. So uh, all of this that you see here, uh, try to remember the, the syntax here of the Rust types. I can show you now in the, in the browser. And uh, first of all, uh, latest is here. That's a parameter we set. We set with latest. Um, and you can set this parameter here. And the response is down below. So that looks oddly similar to what we saw before. But this is a JSON. And this is the Rust repre representation. Um, you could go as far as saying you cannot write an invalid request. Every request you send is always valid. You cannot uh, mix up the data types. You cannot uh, change the order of uh, parameters. You can check the URLs that you send and so on. Pretty cool. But do you want to write all of that yourself? Probably not. Why? Well, I tried to copy all the methods of the Slack API on one slide. It looks a bit like this. You would have to implement all of this for every of those methods. Oh, actually, here's some more. Um, that's a lot. Uh, I mean, I don't consider myself too lazy, but that's even too much for me. So uh, whenever I see something like this, and somebody comes over and says, yeah, you need to implement all of that, please. And if something changes, then please fix it. Um, I have some, yeah, I get, I get some weird dreams, let's say. Um, this is not feasible. We need some smarter way to do it. So how about that? We generate all of that ourselves. So the idea was to have some kind of Slack client create, which has a so-called build rs file. Build rs runs before your compile uh, step, and it can do everything. It can get the resource from the internet, it can create files, it can write code. And this is what we use it for. So this uh, main Rust create, it will call some kind of code generation uh, build rs script. But the build rs script in reality calls another code gen Slack uh, library. Why? Because uh, you don't need to recompile it every time, so it's super fast. And uh, all of the code generation stuff is in another crate, but it can be in the same repository. So uh, the only thing is you trigger it once, it will generate all the code, and then the real Slack client will compile the code and check if it's valid. But this code gen uh, thing has no idea of the Slack API. As you saw, it's just a HTML file, and they have no real documentation for that. Fortunately, there was some guy who had this Slack API ref on GitHub, and uh, it's written in Ruby. Okay, uh, so you run one rake command, um, and it will fetch all those HTML files, and it will generate. Uh, it will run the, through the Slack client, and it will generate all of those uh, specifications for you. So a specification looks a bit like this. Let's go for uh, the method that we saw already. I am history. So that is the speci. speci okay. So that is the speci uh, specification. Oh, somebody knows how to scroll. Uh, huh. View. No, actually. 
I thought zoom it... Zoom out at the bottom. Huh? Yeah, this is zoom in and out at the bottom too. Or is that... Oh, I clicked on zoom in. Actually the other way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. That's kind of awkward. It takes a while. Um, I guess that's big enough. Thanks. Um, every method has a group. Every method has a name, a description, the arguments, if it's a required argument or not, and all of that stuff we need for code generation. So pretty, pretty much what we want. Um, once we use that, uh, the way it looks like is that uh, this build script, it will first, uh, actually the code generation also has error chain built in, so you can also see the errors here. Uh, it will uh, get the schema, create some internal Slack types that we uh, provide, and then for each uh, method, it will write some file to somewhere, uh, to some out directory of the build script. And then from there, it's copied to the source, source folder. And uh, now the, the scary part is, you've seen before how this uh, nice um, builder looks once you write it yourself. But if you want to make it more general, then it looks a bit like this here. So uh, this is written with a template library um, that I kind of like. Um, I can only recommend it to you. It's called Terra. And Terra is Django-like. So it's probably very familiar to you. You have those uh, arguments and so on. And you can pass in every Slack type. And if you do that for the, uh, uh, you can pass in any Rust type. And if you do it for the Slack API, you can uh, go through and render all of that. Um, there's some to-dos here um, that I will come to later. But uh, for the most part, it will just take what you pass it in. For example, a method which has some certain uh, definition. And the definition is exactly here. Uh, the method for each select method, uh, the method type is looking like this. Uh, yes, and we need all of that, and there's some kind of helpers in there. But uh, for the most part, we just render it out one-to-one -one with this uh, code generation part here. For example, here, uh, we render the functions for the builder for each optional argument. And then you can, for example, say, um, with latest, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all of this is generated here. Um, so my, maybe you're now asking, okay, why aren't you using procedural macros? Well, because um, I think uh, I'm more used to that kind of syntax. And also, I don't know how to express that in procedural macros, if it's easier or not, uh, given that uh, there's no AST library, which is stable yet. And uh, so I went with this. Um, the advantage is that all of this is running on stable Rust. So uh, with the procedural macro release uh, lately, you can do all of this magic, all of this deriving and so on in, in, uh, in stable Rust, which is really cool. Yeah, OK, uh, I'm almost done. Now uh, the result looks something like this. You have a client. You hand in a new token. And then you can call the methods. For example, if you want to call im.history, so instant messaging.history, you say im underscore history in your client. Uh, simple enough. You give it some parameters and you click send. Alternatively, if you want to be a bit more specific, uh, Tim gave me the hint to do it a better way. Um, some prefer this way of writing it where you have um, a struct and you write the parameters yourself. Uh, the advantages of that is that maybe you can pre-generate your requests somewhere and then you only need to run them uh, at runtime. And um, all of this can be somewhere else and can be uh, run multiple, time, multiple times. 
Yeah, cool. Um, and once you run this request, the response looks like this. I guess you've seen it before. Uh, you get some IAM history result with the messages in the right types. So what did I learn? Doing anything right is hard. And doing anything right takes time. Uh, you might say, OK, come on, it's a, it's a client for some API. It can't be that hard. I can write it in Bash. Uh, for sure you can. But if you want to write one which is actually not that shitty and is well documented and tested and so on, uh, you need to invest some time. And especially the more simple it looks, usually the harder it is to implement. That was just my experience. Um, let's talk a little bit about the outlook. Um, what is missing? I would love to support the real-time Slack API. Uh, Slack has another API which is based on events. And uh, you could start a long-running process, and it would listen to some event bus and would react on that. So that would be amazing to also include it. Um, I'm planning to do that. Then I need to convert all the remaining Slack types. So for example, one thing would be cool to have a Slack emoji create that has uh, rendered all the emojis that are there in, in uh, Slack. And then you can use it from within Rust. Kind of fancy. Uh, also, timestamps could use a chrono uh, for having a semantic type system. Yeah, iterators for pagination. Sometimes you get a response back uh, with a field saying has more equals true. That means that there's more results that you can query on. And it would be nice to have some kind of iterator over that. So you don't need to call has more with the next parameters. You just say, uh, give me all the responses until uh, the iterator is ex exhausted. That would be really fancy. Um, and also proper into conversions. I'm using strings and int 64s and float 64s right now. Would be nicer to have something like into string. Then you could pass in whatever you want. Uh, for example, static strings or anything that can be converted to a, to a string with the from trade. That would be really fancy as well. And whatever you do, one thing you need to remember, and that's the only takeaway I can give you. Uh, there's some people out there that can give you a lot of hints on how to write a proper one, a uh, proper client for your, for your own use. Uh, and uh, so I can only recommend to you to read Pascal's blog because uh, he has uh, a much better listing of all the things you can do with uh, elegant APIs in Rust. And it's gigantic. And uh, once you do all of this, uh, everything else will come naturally. Yeah, so um, what is left to do is showing you uh, the kind of status of the rendering. Um, the current status is here. Uh, so the... Uh, the stuff that is... Different here is different from the one that I generated myself, uh, the, the one that I wrote myself and the one that I generated. So there's some differences still. Um, for example, maybe you can't read it. Um, here I automatically add comments to every field. Um, the formatting is kind of a bit off sometimes. Like here, there's some weird formatting stuff. OK, uh, we can work with that. Uh, that looks more confusing than it is in reality. In uh, here, the only difference is that I'm using into string here in my version that I wrote. And here, I'm using a hard string. Um, some default types were missing. Uh, I, I changed from with latest to latest because I heard that that's the more idiomatic way. Um, yeah, and uh, also the tests are still missing. So auto-generating the tests is something that I need to do. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the status quo. And uh, thanks so far. <laughs> Any questions? You need a microphone. Yes. <coughs> Is it open source already? 
Yeah, um, I wanted to open source the version today. Um, given the fact that I don't have the test generated already, uh, I want to postpone it. Um, actually, if you think about it, I should maybe just open source it and then develop it in the open because uh, then people could also help me. But I'm doing this as kind of a learning experience. So I kind of want to have it ready, at least some tests, so that people can start contributing and um, not me doing the same mistakes that others did already. So it's kind of, right now, it would not provide much value over the one we already have without tests. That's at least how I see it. But yeah, uh, the, the release is... Right on the right on the edge, right on the verge. <laughs> so now we know how to write a Slack bot, but what would your bot actually do? Um, there's one fancy idea and one not so fancy idea. So one thing that my bot would probably do would be to monitor who's in the office. It sounds more scary than it is, but I want to correlate it with uh, our uh, other metrics that we have. For example, uh, how many rollbacks do we need to do? I, I have the suspicion that uh, the, the less people are in the office, the, the better we do. But uh, it's kind of a, a funny thing. And uh, the more serious topic would be that you have some kind of smart, don't, uh, I'm not available bot. Right now in, in Slack you can have, uh, I'm not available. And then if you write somebody, then he will get a message, oh, oh, this guy doesn't want to be disturbed right now. Do you really want to send him this message or should I send it to him once he's done? Once he's, he can be interrupted. And uh, it's kind of stupid because it, it has no context. And so my idea was to have some kind of natural language processing on uh, the, the request the question that was asked, actually the text. And uh, based on that, I can decide if I want to let my bot answer with some kind of link to the documentation or some kind of yeah, very generic answer. Did you try that? Uh, or if I really want to act. Yeah. Okay then, uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>